disciples of Christ are an offshoot of the Presbyterians. So it makes more sense if you hear the Presbyterian story first. And the second reason is if I were to go first, Andy might not get a turn. So, <laughs> so. Amen. Oh. All right. Feel free to make notes and we'll just go from there. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hands. Who noticed that we changed all the chairs in the sanctuary? Oh. Who is going to be upset about that? All right. <laughs> I just thought we were having a wedding. Yeah, good call. They turn, they, yeah, and then, but then they normally go back after the wedding. So my family comes from a Methodist tradition, but I was raised Southern Baptist, and we can get into that at a later point. But this is this is a funny story to tell you. My family, uh, my dad's family, Methodist for the majority of their lives. And when my grandfather died, you could donate a pew in somebody's name. And so it was donated to my grandfather, uh, who we called Big Henry. And he died relatively young. But anyways, on the back of the pew, it said, dedicated to Henry Kenningsmark. And so for probably 30 years, my grandmother and my Aunt Bill would sit in the same pew. Yes, Aunt Bill. And they would sit in the same pew every Sunday morning. And one day they got there, somebody was sitting in their pew, and Aunt Bill was known not to be very tactful. She was cranky, huh? She was angry. <laughs> and so she, she goes down to this family and says, you're sitting in my seat. And the lady said, well, I didn't see your name on it. <laughs> and Aunt Bill said, why didn't you use your damn eyes? My name is on the back of the seat. Now get out. <laughs> uh, did they move? That's yeah, it. they moved. I don't know if they ever came back to church. <laughs> so Methodists, much like Presbyterians, much like Baptists, whether they admit it or not, the disciples, Church of Christ, we're reformed. It's not a word you would use much in Baptist, Evangelical, Foursquare. Does anybody know why we probably don't even use that word in some of our denominations that we're reformed? Or what that even means? Martin Luther, Martin Luther, right. So we trace our earliest roots to the Reformation of Martin Luther. And really all it means if people say, well, I'm Baptist, I'm not Reformed. They are Reformed. But what it means is basically you're not a part of the Catholic Church, you're not Greek Orthodox, you're not uh, part of that hierarchy. And so when Martin Luther came along, the reason we have the Reformation is because the church at that time had all the power, and specifically the Pope and the bishops. And so the way it worked was, you know, the Pope is considered to be ordained or called by God directly. And so all the power flowed through the church. And so when Martin Luther came along, Martin Luther wanted to give the power back to the individuals and to the churches as a whole. And so, really, it was a deconstruction of the hierarchy of the church. So, anybody that says that they're not Catholic, Greek Orthodox, or whatever, are most likely Reformed. And so, we trace our roots as Presbyterians to the Church of Scotland, and more importantly, we chase, we go to John Calvin, who was part of the, Re the Reformation movement. And so, what does it even mean to be Reformed? Does anybody know what it means to be Reformed? another term for Protestant? Sort of. So it's, it's actually the Protestant Reformation. It's a whole idea. But the biggest parts of it is is really you can trace the, Refor the Reformation to really three ideas. Sovereignty of God. And I thought about it this week when I wrote that word. If somebody asked me to define the word sovereignty, I couldn't do it. Does anybody know what it means? I can now, but does anybody know what the word sovereignty means? Sovereign What's that? Rules over everything. Rules Jason is so much smarter than me. Missed your calling in life. So usually when we say sovereignty, it means power or authority. So you'd say we we as Presbyterians, we as Methodists, we as Church of Christ, we as disciples of Christ, we believe in the authority and power of God. We believe that God is supreme. The next thing that we believe is in the authority of Scripture, and that we believe that it is God ordained, God breathed and that it's actually the Word of God. And we'll come back to this idea of authority of Scripture later. And then grace in Jesus Christ is this idea that we are restored, we have salvation, 
or we can be in a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. That's where we get this idea of grace. Any questions about any of those? Yeah. Um, yes. So the Church of Scotland, is that an offshoot from the Church of England? Uh, yes. And the Church of England broke from the Catholic and became the Episcopal. Well, Anglican Episcopal. Right, Anglican Episcopal. So, so then they just decided they were going to form the Presbyterian? I'll, t I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. So, you know, for all practical purposes, we really just have two offshoots. We really have Catholics and we have Protestants. And anybody that's not a Catholic most likely is a Protestant, whether they call themselves a Protestant or not. It doesn't really matter. And the thing that bothers me is when somebody says, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. And the truth is, <laughs> they are a Christian just like we are Christians. It's just a different kind. What's that? I've heard other, pe other people say that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've heard it the other way. Yeah, you're not and Christian, it's, you're it's Catholic. Painful. Yeah. Some of the most devout Christians I know are Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, but just like somebody can be Catholic and not be a Christian, or somebody can be a Baptist and not be a Christian. That's right. You know, just because you go somewhere doesn't make you that who you are. So... Um, your question was, was it a, a branch? And yes, I mean, really what it is, is it's the same thing that's happening now. And that is, you know, we split between Catholics and Protestants, and then we just keep splitting and splitting and splitting. We find reasons to split. The biggest reason we as Presbyterians split is over this idea that we find in Acts 14.23, and it's this word, presbyteros, and it means elder. And so this, this whole idea is it's a hierarchy. And the way we are ruled within the Presbyterian tradition is that I have a boss who is called the Presbytery. And that is, I have mine, and that is in Santa Fe. And in ours, I think we have 40-something churches. And so above that, I have a general assembly, and then I have a council. And the way it works is it's almost like our system of government. So we have state representatives, and then we have representatives at the, so we go all the way up to the president, per se, and we have the Congress, we have, um, what am I missing there? The House of Representatives, thank you. And so anyways, that's how ours is ruled, is this whole idea, it's a hierarchy. Whereas, and I'm going to go to the Baptist for a second, does anybody know the ruling system of like the Southern Baptist, per se? Oh, the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a Southern Baptist Convention. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. So the way a Baptist church works is basically they're all independent. Congregational. Yeah, it's like it's like a franchise. You can buy your own and you can do whatever you want. Okay. Whereas, let's go to Walmart per se. Walmart is not a franchise. If somebody doesn't own a Walmart. The Walmart Corporation owns a Walmart. And what I mean by that is. One Walmart store basically can't make a decision to do something that the rest of the Walmart stores are not doing. The same is true for Presbyterians. We have to go through a system and a hierarchy. And so let's say I do something, y'all are upset with me. Who would you go to? You would go to my presbytery, okay? And my presbytery chooses not to do something above it. There's another group above them. The reason I'm coming to that is if you're upset with your Baptist minister, who do you go to? You go to your Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. You could go to the Southern Baptist Convention, but they might not do anything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, it's, it's all, so Presbyterians is all about hierarchy and how the government is set up. And so we also believe that everybody within the congregation has voting rights, and everybody has an equal voice. That's, that's one of the biggest differences with Presbyterians. And we'll get to a little bit about our specifically what makes our denomination different than some of the other denominations. So, oh, Andy? Yes, sir. Isn't that very similar to Methodist? It is. One of the biggest differences, is, we'll go ahead and cover this now, Craig, is in the Methodist system, they assign their ministers. Right. And so you have a bishop, and the bishop has an area, kind of like the presbytery, and the bishop will say, I see you have really strong gifts in preaching, or I see you have really pastoral gifts in this church. Um or you've earned your spurs to move to a bigger church. You've earned your spurs to move to a bigger church. But they try to put a minister where they're both where they're going to succeed. But also in the Methodist church, let's say they have somebody who's a real dud of a Methodist minister. They're going to try to hide that person in a church, in a bigger church. But they're not going to take away their job. Um, 
I always say this, and whether people like it or not, being a Presbyterian is like being a member of the union. You know, I, I have certain benefits that I get because I am a Presbyterian, but I'm also, um, also a gun for hire. I can go to any Presbyterian church that wants to call me, but also I'm not guaranteed a job. I mean, if they don't like me, they're going to blackball me, basically. But you have to be approved by the Presbytery. Yes, I have to and be called. Yeah, it's an equal calling. So the Presbytery mm -hmm. has to affirm my call, and the church has to present my call to our Presbytery. Okay, any other questions before I go on to this one that's kind of heavy? Okay, so TULIP is not just Presbyterian, but it is most aligned with what Presbyterians believe. And this is all comes to John Calvin and this idea of Calvinism. And have y'all ever heard this idea of TULIP? Okay, so this, these are really the central, five central tenets of being a Presbyterian is this idea of TULIP. And so we come to this first idea, total depravity. Can anybody tell me what total depravity means without looking it up? Doing without Doing without, yeah, that's basically the idea of total depravity, but that's not what he means by that. So, we're a watch of wicked, or? He means we're totally lost. That. Totally Take lost. JJ, totally lost. You're, lost. you're cut off, no more. You get three <laughs> inches a week. <laughs> JJ, shame on you. JJ knows this better than I do. So this is this idea that we're all sinners and that we all need a God. Okay, and we all need a personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Now, some people get into this, oof, really bothers me. Are we born sinners or do we become sinners? What difference does it make? Okay, I don't really care. Uh, I had a guy in my church who used to just drive me bananas because he'd say, do you think we were born sinners? And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> because the whole thing is we are all sinners and we all need a relationship with God. So that's what the idea of total depravity is. Okay, the next one is this idea of predestination. And so John Calvin would say that we were all chosen from the beginning of time to be in a relationship with God. That there was actual picking and choosing process from the beginning of the world. Before we were even born, God knew the decision we would make. So I discussed this one Sunday morning at church. I'm a firm believer in unconditional election but I believe it a little different than John Calvin. I believe that we were all chosen by God in the beginning of time. Some people will say, foreknowledge, God knows who's going to be an elect and who's not going to be an elect. But I'm a firm believer that God created us, each and every image. one of us, to be in a relationship with God. Well, and we choose not to. Image, we yes. Not to. So this is this idea of predestination. Um, and a lot of people attribute this just to Presbyterians, but... A lot of other people believe this as well. It's just how they live it out. Okay? Um, my view is probably not the same view as all Presbyterians, and that's okay. But I would say that we are all chosen from the beginning of time. So limited atonement is this idea. Does anybody know what that one is? Okay. That means Jesus' love is available to all people. So that means each and every one of us comes into this world with the opportunity to love Jesus and to be loved by Jesus. That's limited atonement. Uh, irresistible grace, this is this idea that whatever we do, we cannot walk away from God's love for us. And was any, how many of y'all were raised Baptist? So in Baptist theology, and I'm not bashing Baptists, it's just what I probably it's know. It's okay. Well, it's, it's, what I, it's what I know very well as opposed to being a Presbyterian. I probably know Baptist theology better than I know Presbyterian theology. Baptists believe once saved, always saved. So if you essentially say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior at the age of two years old, there's nothing you can do to walk away from that. Okay? You could go on to be Jeffrey Dahmer and you're okay. But... This whole idea is, John Calvin is saying that God's love basically reigns supreme over all things in this universe. That there's nothing we can do in our lives to walk away from God's love for us. So I would call that supreme love. Uh, 
I really wish I had a red marker. Peggy, you tell me how I'm doing on time. There, uh, you just go and we'll make a... Okay. Um, and then the, fi the final one here is the perseverance of saints. And um, it's this whole idea that we will do good works through the Spirit. So that we will continue to live out the Christian faith in our life and actions. So I might call that mission, but it's our, um, our either our service to God So we come to this idea, some people would say, because there's five points of, of TULIP, that you're a five-point Calvinist. I would never call myself a five-point Calvinist, but some people really feel the need to say that. Um, the other idea is some people would say that they are a four-point Calvinist, and they would take out this idea of predestination, that they can't live with this idea that there was a picking and choosing before the beginning of the world. But these are the basic tenets of... Presbyterian faith, and that is that we're all sinners, that we all need a God, we all need a, a Messiah or a Christ to bring us into relationship with God, that we were all chosen to be in a relationship with God from the beginning of time, that Jesus' love covers all, that we have irresistible grace, this idea that we can do nothing to walk away from God's love, that even in our imperfect selves, we, were, we will always be enough for God. And then the final one is that we live to serve God, either through our works, through our words, or through our deeds. Okay, any questions about any of those? Andy, when you're talking about Baptist, I think it's important that we mention, are you not talking about Southern Baptist? Because American Baptist is a totally... I am. I am sorry. Okay. You're right. I just so... wanted to be sure that American Baptist is right. a totally totally different thing. Different. And, we, and, there's, and so, um, mm -hmm. Presbyterians, we have relationships and partnerships with other denominations. And American Baptist and Cooperative Baptist are two of those denominations that we have that we are in a fellowship with. Also, Evangelical Lutherans are in that. And also, United Church of Christ is another one that we are an official uh, partnership with. And what that means is that one of those churches can call a Presbyterian minister to serve as their minister, even though it's a, a United Church of Christ. The only way that would be able to be possible is if there was no suitable <coughs> UCC ministers to fill that position first. Andy? On yes, your, sir. On your chart on the other side where you had the tulip. Yes, sir. Okay. And the top of there was Martin Luther. Yes. What would Martin Luther's response to that be? Oof. I don't even know if I can answer what? that. To the tulip. To, to the tulip. Um, the communist. I, you know, here if I could speculate for a moment, Martin Luther was really about this idea of deconstruction. And so... Martin Luther would say anything that is keeping us away from a relationship with God, we need to get rid of. And he so, tried hard. Say, yeah. <laughs> so for us, you know, he would say if this idea of tulip is keeping us from a relationship with God or is creating a barrier, then don't fall into tulip. Then be a tulip. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Be a Baptist. Right. Right. <laughs> He'd say don't fall into tulip. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, Martin Luther's whole thing was. It was, a, it was actual probably anger with the control of the Catholic Church and how and the, the higher... And the depravity, depravity that they were experiencing. Yes. They, they had lost all sense of moral leadership. So within our denomination as a Presbyterian, and I'll, the reason, I should probably say this, the reason I'm Presbyterian is I was at a Methodist church in my senior year in high school and my youth minister left go work for a Presbyterian church, and I left with him to go serve as a youth leader in his church. And when I went to seminary, I was serving a Presbyterian church. They helped me financially with scholarships, and then you go through this process of ordination and it's a, it's, a, it's a very long process, but it's, it's a call process, and then you have to be a candidate, and then you go on to be ordained through the Presbyterian Church. But it's not, 
it's not an easy, and I don't know how it is in disciples. It's pretty much the okay. same. Okay, but it's, it's about a, it's about a three year process to become a, a Presbyterian minister. At least. At least for me, it was longer. And so the main reason I became a, a Presbyterian minister was they were the church that supported me through seminary. They were the church that took me in when I didn't have a church home. They were the church that really stood by my side. And so how could I turn my back on the Presbyterian church? And over the years, I've come to love our denomination more for numerous reasons. So one of the key characteristics about our denomination is people would say that we are the liberal or more progressive wing of the Presbyterian Church. Doesn't really matter to me, whatever you want to say. But we're also the largest of the two denominations, the two main denominations. So we have the PCUSA, which is what our church here is, is one of our four denominations. And then we have the PCA, which is the Presbyterian Church of America. So does anybody know some of the main reasons we split in 1973? Um, allowing women to be in ministry? Yep, so the PCA does not allow women to be in positions of leadership, so they cannot have a ordained woman lead uh, church or be their called clergy. And so our denomination does not have that barrier. For example, in Taos, they have a, uh, her name is Jenna, and she is their senior minister in Taos at the Presbyterian Church there. PCA doesn't have that. Does anybody know a couple of other reasons why the difference is between our two denominations? Or reason we split? Does the PC uh, ordain members of the LBG? LBG? That happened later. Uh -huh. um, that was not an issue in 1973. Mm -hmm. But one was women in positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. The second one was this idea of inerrancy of scripture. And this is a word we like to throw around a lot within um, church circles, but I don't think we do a really good job of explaining it. So does anybody know, if I said the Bible is inerrant, what I would mean by that statement? Whatever is written stands? Stands. Sort of. Sort of. Any other guesses? There are no mistakes. There are no mistakes, yep. And so the word inerrant itself means without error. And so somebody who says the Bible is without error believes that every single idea that is in Scripture is factual and true, that there's no errors. And if a biblical writer said it happened, that's exactly how it happened. For example, if like we... Like Billy Graham. Like Billy Graham, who mm -hmm. I love and was a Presbyterian. Um, and a Democrat. Who knew, right? So um, Franklin Graham, though, not a Democrat. Anyways, uh, <laughs> two different people. Yeah, so anyways, um, this idea of inerrant is, it means it's without error. And so what I'm, what I'm alluding to is we have some passages in Scripture. So like, let's say we have David and Goliath. The best we can tell from reading into Scripture, Goliath, Goliath was probably eight feet tall according to Scripture. Well... Somebody who believes the Bible is inerrant is that Goliath was eight feet tall. That's all there is to it. Uh, doesn't matter. And if, you, if I told you that Goliath was seven foot tall, that's wrong. If I told you Goliath was nine foot tall, that's wrong. He is eight foot tall. Yes, Jim? Is there a difference between inerrant and literal? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a minute. I wasn't going to, but I will. So <laughs> they are tied very heavy-handed. And so I would say literal, you know, let's say inerrance in the middle, literal comes over more even toward me. That idea that we need to believe in six literal days of creation. So the Bible says, you know, day one it happened, that's what it is. You know, that there's no error about that. Um, literal means taking it word for word, this is what it happened. So I think in inerrant there's a little bit more leeway. Literal there is no leeway. And so, for in my tradition, which is PCUSA, we would argue that the Bible is a different word. I would. What do y'all think the difference is between a narrative and fallible? Vonda knows, she's the one to say. JJ knows, but she's scared to say. <laughs> 
So we can say this is semantics, but I would say that the Bible is without failure. And this is what most people in my tradition would say, that the Bible is without failure. And what do I mean by that? It's this idea that if you had never heard about God, you'd never heard about Jesus Christ, and I handed you a Bible, that you could pick it up, read it cover to cover, and understand that from the beginning of time that God had a plan for this world, that we were created for a purpose, and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world to bring us into a relationship with God. We would say that is infallible, that you could not pick up the Bible and read the Bible cover to cover without gaining that story. Now, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. But that was what we would say is infallible. Um, to me, I would say that if you really look at Scripture closely, there are some, we have differences in manuscripts, from the earliest manuscripts to the newest manuscripts. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me. I can really grab onto this idea that it's infallible. That yeah. if we pick up scripture, that we know it's God ordained, that it's God breathed, and it tells the story of God's purpose for our lives and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Any other questions about infallible, inerrant, or literal? So it's not so much about the details it is, it, or all the specific points. It's, it's the overall story. It's, Correct. Yeah. You know, and even if we come to the Gospels... <laughs> And where it says it's without error, I mean, we have different accounts in the Gospels of what even happens at the, at the tomb, you know. And somebody who says it's inerrant would say, well, no, every single one of those encounters happened just that way. And the people, the, so was there one angel? Was there How two angels? Was there no angels? What's that? How is it interpreted? How it's interpreted? But somebody who believes the Bible's inerrant might have to take some heavy steps to try and make it work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, we have parts in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus flips the tables in the temple at the very beginning of the Gospel. Well, in the other Gospel accounts, it happens later in Jesus' ministry. Somebody who's an errant would say, well, obviously Jesus flipped the, table, flipped the tables more than once. You know, somebody who says it's infallible would be like, no, Jesus flipped the tables, or flipped the tables in the temple. doesn't matter when it happened. That's just what happened. Um, somebody who's literal, you know, some of these ideas, they would say, if you don't believe it the way it's written, then you're not a Christian. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, can I interject? Yeah, that? absolutely. We are going to, uh, after this series, and Larry Peckham has the thing, then we're going to do a series on biblical interpretation mm -hmm. and, and how to, how to, in our traditions, to, to yeah. uh, appropriately interpret. That, and that might answer a lot of your questions. That would be interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go on because I need to give Peggy some time here. This I'm morning. okay. Okay, so in 2012, I think that's right. Did I write it down? 2010, we had another split within the PCUSA, and it was over same sex um, members of clergy and whether they could be ordained or not ordained. And so. This is where I come to this idea of social issues. And so these are really the big things that distinguish now between the PCA and the PCUSA and women in positions of leadership. So uh, PCA would say abortion is never okay. That's PCA. PCUSA would say well, we need to look at abortion on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, let's say the mother was her health was in jeopardy and she could die if she gave birth, we would say we would support abortion in that regard. So case by case. Same comes to divorce. PCA here would say divorce is only okay if a spouse is having an affair or is cheating or has done something to leave the marriage. Again, PCUSA would say we need to evaluate each one on a case by case basis. So when we come to LBGTQ, uh, in 2010, we had a split within the PCUSA, and really the biggest split was people from the PCUSA went to a new one called EcoPres, and some went to uh, Evangelical Pres. And what this came down to was this idea that we agree with all the tenets of the, of the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America but we do not think that members of the LGBTQ should be ordained 
as leaders within our denomination. Well, what ultimately happened, and this is very sad, and it's happening in the Methodist Church, is we're going to have a split in the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Within the next probably, next point two years, we're going to have a split. So. And it's really sad, and I wish that wasn't the case. The Presbyterians made a decision that each individual church has the right to call a member of the LGBTQ community, but they don't have to. It's each individual church has that choice, okay? The other thing that the church also has is each church has the authority if they want to do a same-sex wedding, okay? And so our church here, when I interviewed, I said, how do we feel about same-sex marriages? And the general consensus was some people would be okay with it and some people would be against it. And that is okay. Um, but the big thing is you have to decide as a PCUSA church, you know, what your stance is on this and for your individual congregation. And it doesn't have to be the same. Okay? That's the big thing. You know, y'all could go to a, a PCUSA church in Austin, and I know for a fact, they were, I say I know for a fact, they were one of the first PCUSA churches to call a member of the LGBT community to be ordained staff there. That's a fact. That, okay. They will uh, do same-sex weddings at that church, but let's say you go to another PCUSA church in Austin, they may not, and that is okay. Okay, any questions about any of that? Okay. Well, yes. What, what was the question on divorce? Oh, it was just the. Okay. So PCA would say the, the I would say I, for all practical purposes we'll call it the more conservative branch of the Presbyterians. They would say divorce is only okay if a spouse is having an affair or cheating or beating you up or beating you. Well, I, I, uh, 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 you, for, you forgot to might, duck. Okay. They might not. <laughs> Okay. Whereas the PCUSA would say, you know, each divorce has its, or each marriage has its own set of difficulties and problems. So they would say, your wife's an alcoholic, that's grounds for a divorce. You're in an abusive relationship, that's grounds for a divorce. PCA might not. Um, also, the PCA, let's say your minister has a, gets a divorce, um, he, he or he, because in the PCA it's going to be a man, might be asked to leave his position. The PCUSA, would say it's case by case basis. It's not just grounds for removal. Any other questions about that? Yes. Andy, when you look at a Presbyterian church and the and the marquee that's outside, yes, how do you know which of these it is? Oh, good question. Um, you might not. That's and that's just the, that's just the reality of it. Most likely, it's going to be a PC USA church because it's the largest denomination, and the PCAs want you to know that they are PCA. Um, with this new switch to evangelical and eco uh, you're probably not going to know. It's probably a safe assumption though, that they were once PCUSA. So I think within the United States, I think there's three million Presbyterian PCUSA, and I think this number is like close to like 200, 200,000. So most likely it's going to be a PCUSA. Um, you can also look at their logo. Oh yeah, the logo is different, but you would have to know. Yeah, so the, we'll, and we're going to talk about that in worship next week. So then, if we come to the reasons the Presbyterian Church was formed originally in about 1810, or, or sorry, the most current form of the Presbyterian Church was in about 1810, and it was a split over slavery. And, and that's where the PCUSA and the PCA come from, was a split there. And it, and it came from the process of ordination. And in 1810, we said that our ministers have to be formally trained. They have to go to seminary, and they have to go through a call process. And the reason I point this out, and people ask me in our church why I don't like to be called pastor, the reason why is I found that a lot of people that go by the term pastor probably do not have a theological education, formal theological education. So in some of our denominations, you do not have to be seminary trained, nor do you even have to have a college degree. The 1810 training would be in some universities now we would not associate with religion. Correct, which is interesting. So a lot of people don't realize this. Harvard, Princeton, Yale were started as seminaries. Um, Harvard still and Princeton and Yale all still have seminaries. Uh, but 
We can get into that on a well, different day. It's like, it's like uh, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. That's a disciple school, but now there's the university, and then there's Bright Divinity School that is uh, that's attached to the seminary. So they're the same, this, they're the same but different. <laughs> so when we go back to 1810, when we started beginning to found the earliest roots of the PCUSA, the PCA, that was one of the things that set us apart, was we said that our ministers must be theologically trained. And not only do they have to be theologically trained, a lot of people don't realize this, but Presbyterian ministers have to go through like a, almost like passing the board for lawyers. You can't just go through seminary and become a Presbyterian minister. You have to go through, I think it's five tests. And I think I've read recently that only 25% of Presbyterian ministers passed their boards their first time. I did not, just so you know. I failed a couple times. Um, mine, believe it or not, mine all had to come down to my preaching. Uh, they said they, my preaching was not sound, which I said, you were wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the process of ordination, like I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go back up. To sure. Saying they have to be theologically trained. That made it real challenging for both the uh, the Western Frontier movement because the Presbyterians and the Disciples needed to be theologically trained. That kind of left them in the dust of some of these other denominations that would move, particularly the Southern ba the Baptist, whatever, and as Methodist. they were moving west and establishing their churches. Well. Disciples and Presbyterians are going, well, you're not ready yet. So, like I said, they kind of ate the dust of some of the other denominations. I have a question. Sure. Is the disciples of Christ the same as Church of Christ? We'll talk about that when it's my turn. Okay. The answer is no. No. The answer is no. Simply, no. and United no. Church of Christ is not the same as Church of Christ. Um, way different. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say way different. Okay, so then we go to the call process, and that's the process of how a minister comes to be somewhere. And the best way to explain it, it's like dating. Um, and that, and there's no tender for the call process. But you say, I like you, and then they have to turn say, and we like you, and we would like to continue this process. And that's how a minister goes to be called. It has to be an equal choosing. And the congregation actually has a vote in that. And then my hierarchy, which is the presbytery, also has a vote in that. And so that's the call process. That's another thing that sets us apart. Another thing that is unique to Presbyterians and not to some others is we believe we're a confessional tradition, which means Apostles' Creed, Nicene's Creed. And the idea is we believe that Scripture is the foundation for our belief, and then our confessions are a response to what we actually believe. And so that's why we sometimes in church will read the Nicene's Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And if you go to some uh, Presbyterian churches, they will read the creeds every single week. It really just depends on your church's culture and history coming forward on that. Something else we believe as Presbyterians is we believe actions speak louder than words. And we are very interested in being justice-minded. And so what I mean by that is if we, see, if we see something taking place within our country, within our world, within our communities, and we say we can respond to this, we believe deeply in making an impact that is felt not just with words. Didn't you preach that last week? I might have. <laughs> but we also, as a church here, say that we are divine love and action. And so we are living that out within our church theology here. Uh, we vote. And I said that that's where we get the idea of uh, presbyteros, is that we all have equal votes within the church. And then within our denomination, we believe, really believe we only have two holy sacraments, and that is baptism and communion. And so people will ask this, or, um, does anybody know why we baptize as infants in the Presbyterian church? Right thing <laughs> I like that. I like Chris's answer. It's the right thing to do. What's that? Sort of. I mean, we are predestined according to Presbyterian, but that's not exactly why we do it. Does anybody know why we. Yeah. Is it to bring them up in the religious? Yes. So, why do we baptize? And we're going to go to the Baptist. Uh, we'll go to the Southern Baptist. Does anybody know why the Southern Baptist baptized? 
Because yeah. you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yes, it's a public confession of public faith. Public confession, yes. And so, within Methodist, uh, Episcopal, Catholic, Presbyterians, I don't know about disciples. I assume it's the same. Not? What, infant baptism? Uh -huh. We do not do that. Okay, part of my Lutherans. Lesson. Lutherans, the reason we do it, we are saying when the child is born, we give this child over to God. To God. And that mm -hmm. as, as a family, a church family, we are going to raise this child in the ways of God until they can make this decision for themselves. Right. Presbyterians believe once baptized, always baptized. And so that's a question I was asked in my ordination. They said, what if you had an adult that was baptized as a Catholic as a child and they want to be baptized as an adult? And I said, it's fine with me. I'll, I'll baptize them again. And they said, well, that doesn't count. I said, I fully understand that. So we believe there's only one baptism, and every time after that, you're just getting wet. <laughs> and, and it should be in the summer. And it should be in the summer. <laughs> now, me personally, I was asked that question. They said, what if somebody as an adult wanted to be rebaptized? And I said, if somebody as an adult wants to be rebaptized, I'll, I'll, I'll baptize them every summer. Because if it means so much to them in their journey of faith, mm -hmm. that they need to get wet every summer, so be it. Okay? I was baptized as an adult. I was not an infant baptism. Any other questions about this at the moment? Well, and also in the Methodist Church, sometimes they call it reaffirmation. Yep. Yes. Because yes. you didn't remember it. And right. You want to make this, you want to make this proclamation in front of your church family. Or rededication. Well, and part of the reason we sprinkle is because it's easier. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you want to be submerged, there's nothing within our tradition that says you cannot be fully dunked. I've, I, have, I have dropped some people in, okay? I have, I've, I've dunked both of my children in. Um, so and, marriage and is in the sacrament. What's that? No, no, marriage is not no we just have two holy sacraments within the Presbyterian Church. Okay. And, and that goes back to the Lima document that we talked about last week with the similarities with baptism and Eucharist and ministry. Okay. You know, the, the, most all of our churches are connected there, if, if I may. And even though the, the disciples do not baptize as infants, what we do have is a baby dedication service, which is very much the same thing. And then a, a kiddo will go through what the uh, Presbyterians call confirmation class. We usually call it pastor's class or something like that. And then they will be baptized when they're uh, about 10 plus, depending upon the you know, maturity of the child and the, the parent's wishes. So we don't leave, disciples don't leave that, that little kid out in the cold. That's what, you know, that's what I want, want you to know about that. And then with communion, we believe that the present, that the spirit is present in that moment. Where, how many of y'all in here were raised Catholic? Okay, nothing wrong with that. Love Catholic. Um, <laughs> There's a word in the Catholic tradition, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's transubstantiation. You got it. Oh, okay. Well, I usually butcher it. And the idea in Catholic theology is that the Spirit of Christ is actually physically and spiritually present in the elements, so that when you actually take the bread, you are actually ingesting the flesh or the body of Jesus, and when you drink the wine, you're actually ingesting the blood of wine. And that's why the Catholic priest actually drinks the entire wine so they can get a little buzz after service <laughs> also, because it's it's become holy and consecrated yes. now until when it comes to the altar not holy and consecrated at the moment that the, the priest actually blesses it it becomes the physical body and blood of Christ <clears throat> Presbyterians Methodists uh, disciples uh, United Church of Christ, we do not believe that. We believe that the Spirit of Christ is in the element in that moment. And the word is? I don't remember that one. Consubstantiation. Okay, I would have gotten that one wrong. <laughs> um, so for me, for me, you know, if somebody says, do you believe that, that Jesus is physically present in the elements? Physically, no. Spiritually, yes. yes. Um, you know, but if we have people that want to worship with us, and they say that I believe that the elements physically turn into the blood, the blood and body of Christ, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That doesn't that doesn't it, affect me. personal. It doesn't affect my journey of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the biggest thing about Presbyterians is our form of government, and that's what our word comes from. Presbyteros is all about our government, and that everybody has a voice within it, and so it's very democratic if you want to use that word. 
Okay, that is my brief synopsis of Presbyterians. I'll take any questions for y'all. Um, I have a suggestion since um, it's... I went long? But, and it's okay. It's fine. You know, this is in public school. We don't have to be on the same page all the time. Why don't we take this time to ask questions, and even questions from last week, and then we'll do the disciples next week so that we're not chopped up. Oh, How's so that? Somebody that asked okay? me a Protestant question. Uh, was it Chris? Somebody asked me a Protestant question. So, one of the biggest differences when we separated from the Catholic Church, it put the power back into the hands of the people. So, in the Catholic Church, um, I don't. It wasn't meant to be this way initially, but the power went to the to the priest or the bishop or the pope. And the idea was that you had to go to this person to take your prayers and concerns to God, and that you also had to go to have your sins, you had to confess your sins and also have forgiveness of your sins because this person would take these grievances to God on your behalf. And if you I think enough it's a, money, you, can, you get by with a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I think it's actually a really beautiful concept. But, the, but Protestants just said, what if we don't have a, a bishop or a priest or a pope that this is not the way I read it in Scripture. It seems that our faith in Jesus Christ is meant for all of mankind. Yes? And we don't need an intermediary. In that's the Protestant way, tradition, yes. Yeah. That's, okay. that's what I learned in Catechism in the Lutheran Church, was we don't, we don't need, well, and not to disrespect Mary, but we, we really don't need to pray to Mary. Right. We can pray directly to God, to God, do that, we channel that through Christ, and that's appropriate, but we don't have to have an intermediary. No, and so it just means that Protestants, we have the authority to share God's word and love with others, that we don't need a special title or power. I, the only thing I'll say about Mary, and this is something that I truly value about the Catholic Church. Does anybody know that's not Catholic why we pray or in theory pray to Mary? Intermediary. <laughs> it is an intermediary. And I love this idea. When it was explained to me, somebody said to me, you ever had something that felt so painful that you didn't think you could tell your dad but you only could tell your mom? So in the Catholic Church, it's this idea of this is so painful that I'm going to take it to my mom to take it to my dad for and once I heard it in those terms, it, was, it became so much more powerful. And so we still have this idea of the intermediary within the Protestant church, and that is, you know, sometimes you feel like there's something that you need to tell your pastor or your minister. Um, and it's not that they don't, you don't feel like they, you can't take it to God yourself, but it's sometimes you just need a little bit of spiritual wisdom that um, you might not have that moment. And so you go to your minister, you go to your pastor, you go to your priest. Well, they also pray to saints, too. So are they yeah. in America? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's, it's the idea of when we go back to the perseverance of saints, that we would say, well, um, Assisi did this, and we're going to do this in remembrance of Assisi. We're going to do this in remembrance of St. Peter, St. Andrew. Um, and really, is, it's just respect. Really it's in honor of. Yeah, it's respect and reverence of, of our early church fathers, including Mary. I want to go back to Mary for just a second. Sure. I, think, I think as Protestants, we don't, give, we don't always give enough credit to Mary, the Mother of God. And I think that's sometimes where our disconnect comes in between with our, our understandings of Mary. And I did go through Catholic catechism, long story, for another decade, all right? Um, but another reason is like, um, um, like I know Andy's mom really well. We're really good friends, you know, and I want Andy to do something. And I know Andy's going to kind of waffle on me. And so I'm going to go, um, Andy's mom, that's right, I know her name. Margaret. I, uh, <laughs> Margaret. Um, could you help me with this? Could you, could you put a good word in for me with, for for uh, with Andy about this? And so maybe I'm kind of talking it over <laughs> with Margaret. I'm talking it over with Margaret before I go to Andy. And if Margaret thinks it's a good idea, that she will help intercede for me. Does that does that help also with understanding of Mary? Well, that's networking too. Yeah, yeah networking. Yeah. I want to just. 
change the subject a little bit. No, no, no. Didn't like the Protestant movement also come out because the Church of England didn't want to send their money to the Vatican? No, Henry VIII wanted to get married, Henry, get remarried. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I think that, that was part of it, but I think it was more. You didn't want to lose the money, huh? They wanted to keep the money in England. I mean, we could say all these different things played right. into it, but basically it was taking away power and giving it back to the people. Right. And and it's the same reason like why we don't have a king in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to give power back to the people. Yes. And it's the same with the church, because you know, Jesus Christ came from a central to build up and not for a hierarchy to, to look down. down. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> on a less serious note. Yes. When did we go from wine to grape juice? Oh, good question. I don't actually have the answer for that one. That was a bad decision. I do, I mean, you know, I don't I know, know the answer, the answer to yeah. that, and I only do know the answer to that because of Doug McPherson. And when I tell this story, you all will remember, Doug McPherson was a retired Methodist superintendent that lived here for many years and endeared himself to this community and was uh, an interim for a year here before Richard came. It, the wine to grape juice goes back to prohibition and it goes back to uh, Welch's grape juice and the Welch's grape juice having a during pro prohibition having a great influence on the populace at the time okay. well, I read, Janet, Janet Alton told me the story that they used to hear had grape juice and wine stations here but, yeah no. Well, maybe that's just a story. Somebody said the wine line was way too long. Oh, okay. So at my old church, we used to have both. We used to have wine and grape juice. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we did is because we had a large population of Catholics. Mm -hmm. And we used to have wine and grape juice. Um, and the reason we did is because we had a large population of um, AA members that went to our church. On your list on the back, oh. when you're going through Presbyterian. Yes. But, and so, no mention of unconditional love. But, where does that fit in? Well, that's that idea of grace. Mm -hmm. And so if we go back to... <laughs> that's in Tulip, so that's I, irresistible grace. There's nothing we can do to walk away from God's love. No, I'm talking about from us out, unconditional love. What are we, are we supposed to live that? Oh, so ours is through action. Okay. That's what we preach within the Presbyterian Church, that our actions are so much more important than our words. Um, and if we are not responding in actions, then we are not doing our job. One of my mentors said, you've got to love everybody, but you don't have to like them. Okay. One of the, and, and I've been involved in the Presbyterian Church since uh, 1986, the unconditional election has been very fuzzy. There are some people who have interpreted that to mean every action you take has been determined in advance versus you, I love the way you said this, we were chosen. That's not a chance. It is a given that God chose us to be his people. We have the choice to accept that. To accept that or not. Yeah, and some, and and some that's very strong for me. <laughs> some Presbyterians would disagree with me and say that that's poor theology. Oh. Um, I would say it's open and inclusive theology, and some people might push back on me about that. Um, you know, it's not something I feel the need to fight about because it goes back to, to me, it goes to number one, uh, to T. When people say, are we born sinners or we become sinners? And I'm like, what, what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. It's we, our condition. It's our condition. We need God. You know, we we need a, a relationship with a God that restores us. Um, so if we go to unconditional election, you could say that there's a picking and choosing process at the beginning of the world, but what good does that do you? Really? Well, you go back and talk about reading the whole Bible. Yeah. And you get through those first five or six chapters, and he... He lifts the people up and they fall flat in their face. Yeah. Well, let's try this. He lifts those people up, they push back and they fall on their face. And it comes back to the T. There's the T. We're all sinners and unless unless we find that way to make the connection, we're 
Right. We're faders. Well, and you know, Jim brought up a good, a good point about literalism um, and inerrancy. And something that we believe in the Presbyterian um, church, and this is a question we often ask, and this is something I think we all need to ask, is this question right here. And that is, what is just? What is just? And what I mean by that is when we think about how we treat somebody, we would ask, is that just? You know, is that the way Jesus would want us to treat that person? Is that just? And so, you know, when we read Scripture as Christians, we're called to read it in the light of Jesus Christ and what is just. And a lot of times we don't read Scripture in that light. We love, as humans, we love to have categories and divide. And that really breaks my heart within what's going on within the United Methodist Church. I wish that wasn't the case. But isn't there a big difference between what is just in the Old Testament and oh, yeah. what is just in the New Testament? Correct. And so, oh, yeah. to me, that's when you have to come into the, the line of Jesus Christ. Sure. You know, Jesus Christ says, I came to fulfill the law, you know. And um, he also says, you're no longer under the law. You know, and so it's this idea of what is just, because if we look at Leviticus, there's a lot of things that we break in Leviticus every day. And we would say, well, is that just? Like, we shouldn't be wearing, basically, we shouldn't be wearing workout clothes because most of them are a blend of fabrics. You know, we shouldn't be eating lobster. We shouldn't be eating pig. And a lot of this is because we didn't have cat cores for it. We didn't know we should be doing it. But there's also a lot but of things. But you need grasshoppers. Yeah. Duration. But there's also a lot of things that we can learn in Scripture, too, that we have we, we, uh, discarded. I mean, like we, we can learn a lot about agriculture from the Old Testament that we've discarded. And we shouldn't have. And we shouldn't have. Because yeah. <laughs> we're ruined for it now. Yeah. Yes, Craig. So there's several things you've talked about that you're that are gray and yes, sir. predestination is one of them. But for this church today, just because we're on film here and everything, tell me what the non-negotiables are. Ah, good question. So if we said non-negotiables within our church or the Presbyterian? Within our church, this church here is United Church of Angels. Oh, good question. Okay, so, you know, that's a really good question. Peggy's been here longer than me. You know, to me, the biggest non-negotiable we have first and foremost is our actions. You know, are we living as Christians outside of this church and outside of this? Um, so the other ones, I would say, you know, Craig, if we want to look at Tula and we really said, you know, we are going to hold on to this. And Peggy, you can you can jump in here anytime you want. You know, I think this is this is essential that we all um, need God. All need God. Yes. You know, to me, this is a this is one that you we we can take out as a church. Um, this is one that we cannot take out. You know, obviously, Jesus love. That Jesus' love is available to everyone at all times and throughout history. That is a non-negotiable. Uh, that there's nothing we can do to walk away from God's love. That's a non-negotiable. The perseverance of saints, you know, we don't talk about that much, you know. But I truly believe that we do talk about our actions. And that's something that's very important. It's like how we live. So the other one I would say, this is, you know, the authority of Scripture you know, this, the authority of God, that we believe that God is our supreme and is the author of our faith. And then we find grace in Jesus Christ, which goes back to uh, limited atonement and also ir irresistible grace. Peggy, what else do you feel like we've left out? Well, I, I'm just going to simplify it sure. uh, uh, greatly. And I'm going to, two things, and this is from the disciples' perspective, two things that are non-negotiable. God is love. Christ died for all. And all means all. I'd like to change the name of the church so to Four Pointers. <laughs> yeah. Four Pointers. <laughs> so, I think on that note, it's 10, 1045. Yeah, the only thing I'll say, Craig, in response, and i got to head up. Um, and I've said, this, I've said this before. You know, we are a Christian church. We believe that our relationship through to God comes through the person and the character of Jesus Christ. 
Um, and for us to be in a relationship with God, we can only find that relationship through Jesus Christ. That is, that is a central tenet to the Christian faith. And so we as a church, that's not just this church, but that is Christian churches as a whole, you know, that we find our relationship to God through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and then if we look at, this word, look at this word salvation, the word actually means restore. So it means to be put back in relationship with God. And we find that relationship through the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Just a question about yes, destination. Absolutely. Uh, I think that there's a huge difference between God choosing and God knowing. Oh, agreed. Yeah. That's if not, we're out of time, which we will be in heaven, I mean, there's no, there's no concept of time. If if it's one day, it's like a thousand years. I mean, it just makes no difference. Right. Then I think it's different from saying God knows because He sees it all. And he knows whether I am going to become saved through the blood of Christ. Not that he's choosing me to do that, but he just sees eventually in my life, because he's out of time, he sees that that's going to happen. So I think that is the notion of predestination, I think, implies too much of choosing rather than knowing. I would agree, and we have a word for that. It's foreknowledge. Foreknowledge, yes. You know? for so knowledge, I guess, I think here's it's... a question I have for you, Harry. You would call yourself a Christian, right? Yes. You'd say you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Through that relationship, you have a relationship with God. And yes. you live in a Thank you, life. Lord. Thank yes. you. So the question I would have for you is, would it make a difference in your journey of faith if it was a picking and choosing or if it was foreknowledge? Well, I think if it was picking and choosing, I would call it. God, God judgmental. Yeah. And I don't like to think that he's judgmental like that. I like to think that he just simply wants everybody to come to Christ, but in his foreknowledge, he sees that some will and some won't. And, and he and, knows that. And that's the thing within us being four denominations is one, we, we pick our battles. We say we might be different on this, but is it worth really destroying a church over? No. And yeah. the answer is no. No, that's correct. You know, in my opinion. Yep. You know, and so I, I get really sad thinking about churches splitting over what I find to be very minor uh, differences in theology. Yes. You know, because what if what if we have people at our church on Sunday morning that are like, no, I believe this is the actual blood and body of Christ present in the sacraments, and you say, no, nah, it's just the Spirit. Some people are going to split over that, and it's like, why can't we say it's welcome? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but some people have split over the color of the carpet, too. Yeah, and so it's funny. We can have yeah, differences. Exactly right. Even the paint the foyer. Who do you cheer for in sports? Who do I cheer for? Yeah, who do you cheer for in sports? Dallas Cowboys and the, and the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Great. I'm a, Fal I'm a Falcons fan. They're terrible. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but why can't we have that difference within mm -hmm. the church? It doesn't mean that... I mean, obviously, the Kansas City Chiefs are better than the Falcons. There's no doubt about that. But we take these stances in the church where we say, you have to believe it this way, or you can't be a part of this right. team. Which, that's not true. Yeah, that's, not that's one of the strengths of this church. Yeah, yes. it is. Yes. And so, we can, you, and I both can be, that, you and I both can be NFL fans, but it doesn't mean we both have to be Kansas City Chiefs fans. And you don't even have to be an NFL fan and you could be a part of us. No, you do. <laughs> I do. Well, let's close on that note. We will do disciples. Andy, you, actually, you gave me a huge gift because I will be preaching next week. And, and it's, it's a lot of work to prepare a lesson and a, a, a worship service. And now my lesson's done. So, so this worked out great. And I knew when you said 20 minutes that wasn't going to work. Sorry. So, but it's perfect. It, it worked out perfectly for me.